right. Hi, Slash. Hi, Yanni. Hi, Mika. Good to be with you here today. So over the next 30 minutes or so, uh, we're going to dive into the tectonic shifts that are shaping venture capital in Europe. But maybe before we get into that, uh, we could start with sort of a conversation starter. Um, so perhaps you could share your story. How did you end up in the world of venture capital in the worst place? If you Mika, want to start. Sure, I'll start. Um, I realized a few years ago that I really enjoy looking for talent and new ideas. My very first uh, part of my career, I was in the music industry and I signed artists. And so that was a, looking for talent and ideas then too. And then, then for the last 20 years, I was an entrepreneur. I was based in San Francisco. Um, and you know, that went well, but also on the side, I was an angel investor. And when I was being an angel investor, I, I realized also that it was like looking for talent and ideas. It was very similar to what I'd done most of my career in different, different jobs. Uh, and so then um, I thought, okay, maybe I should think about VC. I had a good track record, and when I decided I want to do VC, I actually moved to Europe to do it. Uh, and that's where I'm based. I'm based in Zurich for Lakestar. Yeah, thanks. How about you, Yannick? Uh, my, my story is a lot less cooler than Mika's. <laughs> uh, um, so I spent uh, 20 years in banking, and I spent... Oops. They hate banking here. <laughs> Um, Certainly. Yeah, so I, I spent 20 years in banking and then um, um, I, I, throughout the time I helped companies essentially when they, things were going wrong. And I spent the whole time interacting with regulators and compliance officers and everything. So when I left, I really wanted to kind of uh, shift and change into actually helping companies at the beginning rather than trying to help them at the end. So I was lucky enough to join SoftBank and I can tell you it's kind of been a complete kind of change for me. Um, Meeting with founders and meeting with young people that want to change the world has an infectious optimism. So I go home a lot happier every day compared to like being at a bank where it has a kind of weight upon you on a daily basis. So for me, it was kind of luck to be able to go to SoftBank after my, uh, my banking career, but it's one that I've, uh, I've loved every minute of since I've been there. Yeah, kids is here. Okay, um, so then on the topic of venture capital in Europe. So uh, once again, Europe is going to post a record year in tech investment. Actually, it looks like we're going to cross 100 billion invested in a single year. Uh, that's a crazy figure. Uh, and Janne, this is clearly something that you're also contributed at SoftBank. Uh, so the Vision Fund 1 made only around seven investments in Europe, uh, and the share number has been um, remarkably higher with your fund number two. So what has made Europe look so much more interesting in just a few years? Yeah, you're right. So our first fund that was invested between 17 and 19 only had like 8% of the fund invested in Europe. In our second fund that we've been investing since uh, has 28% uh, in Europe. So it's been, uh, as you say, a big increase uh, between uh, Sorry, let me... Let me. Thank you. <laughs> uh, a big increase between fund one and fund two. And I think uh, a bunch of factors have contributed. I think we'll discuss a lot of them all during, during our conversation here. But I think it's a combination of where global valuations are. Uh, I do think Europe right now probably offers a lot of value compared to some of the other areas, particularly places like India, for example, which have, uh, have valuations have gone kind of through the roof. But more importantly, I think that the European ecosystem has really matured. I think, uh, one, you have companies that, um, where, you, where founders in Europe have become a lot more ambitious and they're willing to kind of stick with the company much longer. They no longer sell as early. And that's created a number of mature companies that can be able to absorb that late stage cap that we provide and other investors provide. So I think it really is a change in the European ecosystem that has allowed kind of much more mature, larger companies to kind of produce over the course of the last few years. Yeah, how about Mika? How, how do you see the development of the European attractiveness? Um, I, I completely agree with what he said there. And it's, what's interesting is that um, in the past, if you had an idea in Europe, you would move to Silicon Valley. Um, or maybe you would move to uh, a Berlin or, or London, but now you can stay put. So I think it's, there's been an incredible diversity of, of, uh, of ideas coming from all over Europe. And I think this, it's, just, and it's just getting started. I really feel that, you know, I've, I've been, uh, especially in the Finnish ecosystem, I've been since the early 2000s, I've been involved in various startups here. And, you know, there's, there's been some success stories, but really it's just getting started, I think, in terms of the, the, the the startup uh, world in Europe, but I like the diversity too. It's just so many different types of companies that are coming out. 
Yeah. Well, it's safe to assume that investors at large uh, agree with you with the European attractiveness. The amount of money raised and available in Europe, especially in the crowd space, uh, is something unheard of. Uh, and it might be difficult to even end up uh, in any other conclusion that there is actually more money in the market than good companies to deploy it. Uh, are you with me in this statement or not? Perhaps, Mika, you can start. So, so say that again, is it more money deployed? Uh, yeah, so is there more money in the market than good companies to deploy it? Uh, yes, I, I, you know, it's, it's um, the number of quality companies has increased. It's not like there are a few companies and a lot of capital chasing it. Um, and so, I haven't seen, maybe I don't, I don't know if SoftBank has seen it, but we haven't seen a dearth of deals. It wasn't because, you know, there's, there's not enough for us to deploy capital on, so there's plenty of companies. Yeah. How do you see it? Yeah, I agree. I think uh, there's a lot of great companies in Europe. I think part of what we discussed earlier, it becomes a bit of a virtuous circle. As you have capital come in, you also see companies that are being created, and it takes a couple of years for that's happened. Um, but importantly, I think, uh, as, 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 as Mika mentioned, there is so much diversification out where the companies are. You can find great companies in areas of, the, of Europe that you didn't expect them before. So as you become localized and you look at the various kind of areas of Europe, you can find amazing companies away from the big uh, kind of tech centers. And what's great is that those entrepreneurs and those founders in those countries where traditionally would have just sold early to some of the big companies from the Valley or from London are now willing to stick with it and create a large company. So for me, it's not just kind of there are great companies in Europe, but what's really heartening for me is there's great U companies all over Europe, and you can find great, great founders in a lot of weird locations. Yeah, so I th you know, there, are, there are 27 countries in Europe, so that's incredible diversity. In the past, the criticism was that there are 27 countries, that's fragmented, it's difficult to operate, how do you go across the borders and everything else, but with 27 countries, it means that there are 27 diverse views on how to solve problems. I mean, way more than 27. I mean, every city in those countries have, have different views, and so, because what really drives uh, entrepreneurship is three things. It's ideas, which is what those 27 you know, countries of diversity provides, capital, and talent. And, and these are now available. So the ideas were always there, but if you were actually going to start a company uh, in, in, in your own country, you probably had to move to either uh, a big center or to the US or something, but now you can actually start it there. Um, and I think there's a lot of reasons that's happening, is that the, not only is there talent that has scaled companies available and capital from people like us that are providing it, but a lot of these uh, uh, companies now have global ambitions from the beginning. What I didn't see 10 years ago, or even five years ago sometimes in some countries, is that everyone in these countries now, uh, in these companies now, they all do uh, their business in English. I think this is a big change. In Finland, it's been English forever, but in a lot of countries, it was in their local language, and, and part of it was that they weren't thinking big enough, they weren't thinking global enough. And so why English is important is that if you're in a, you're a country, and if you want to get the other things going, the talent and the capital, you need to maybe hire people from somewhere else. You might hire someone from Amsterdam, or someone from London, or someone from New York, and English is gonna be the language. And if they're gonna come to your company, and you're speaking your local language, it becomes very alienating, it's very difficult then to scale and to have that talent. And so, you know, the combination of the fact that there's just capital available, ideas are everywhere, very unique ideas, um, and, then, and then there's talent that's moving around, and because it's being English, it actually works. Um, I've, I'm finding that, you know, Europe is becoming an incredibly robust, uh, you know, 27 countries that are really spitting out really amazing companies. And, and it's just, I, I keep saying it, it's just, it's just getting started, because this flywheel of these three things, ideas, talent, and capital, it's just getting going. Yeah, that is, that is, Definitely true. Okay, so when we think of uh, this dynamic from the founder's perspective, so uh, there is a lot of available capital. Uh, VCs are fighting for the best, best investment opportunities. Uh, how has it set, changed the dynamics for, for the founder? How have the um, fundraising processes uh, developed? Janne. Yeah, so I think, um, you know, as you said, there is a, a lot of available capital, and founders can almost all, often get overwhelmed by that. But I think um, not all capital is the same. So I think, and I'm not saying some people are bad or, or good, like different founders and different companies require a different type of capital. So I think once you break it down that way, every one of us, when we compete for deals, we bring something different for the table. So the one thing that I do think that founders should look at is basically what are they looking for from their next capital partner, right? And I think that will kind of be able to narrow it down quite a bit. But from our perspective, as we look at some of these deals, it's definitely a lot faster. 
um, you can no longer kind of wait around to kind of fully make up your mind and analysis, you know, paralysis by analysis. You kind of need to move quite fast. And, uh, you know, some of the times you actually need to uh, probably do a bit less work than you've done in the past. You need to take some things on faith because if you wait around, you're just not going to be able to get it done. So for my side, for, for my side, the thing that's probably changed the most is the speed of these rounds and how quickly you need to be able to react. I would agree with that. Also that um, there's a lot more local capital available. So there are these seed funds have now sprouted up in every country in Europe. We talk to them a lot. There's in just in, in these seed funds, I think, are kind of the, the first line. Well, the first line actually is a lot of these angel, angel uh, uh, investors, angel groups and such, so pre-seed. But um, because there's all these seed funds there, uh, there is actual local capital available. And so I think the question a founder has sometimes at the earliest stages is like, okay, do I go with my local person who is going to be maybe very helpful because they're local? Or do I go with maybe a Europe-wide one like Lake Star? Or do I go maybe with an international one from the U.S. or something? And, and that... That at that early stage, I think, is, is a kind of a, it's, it's a, it's a, for me, it's an obvious decision. You should go with as local as possible because you need to get help. But the, the challenge is that there's some big funds going local, earlier and earlier. And so it's very alluring to take money maybe from an international VC at the very earliest stages. Um, but, you know, if, if I counsel a founder, I say, like, look, you can take that money later. So for me, the, all this capital coming in, also it matters which stage you are as a company. Are you, are you seed? Are you series A, series B? Do you need growth capital? I think that also matters what type of capital you want. And I do think that you know, the best companies have a lot of choices. And I think the, the founders that have their feet in the ground are really thinking, I think as Yanni said, is that they're thinking about the, the long term, um, that then they will make the right decision. But they, they have to really, they have to, they have to know what they're looking for at that time. I think that's the challenge. Yeah. That is definitely true. How about then if you think that from your perspective, has your work as a VC investor changed uh, when the kind of landscape has become so much more competitive? Well, you said it well. You have to move a lot faster. <laughs> There's a lot more speed involved. Uh, and so the, the, the challenge is that, you know, how can you have done enough research and have enough of a relationship with a company so that you are ready to move when it's time to uh, invest in them. And so our strategy is that we try to get to know the companies as early as possible. We may not invest at pre-seed or seed or even series A, but we will track the company, be helpful to them in some ways, and we'll just want to watch that company. So then when it's time for them to do a round, we will know how they've navigated the ups and downs of entrepreneurship. Because that's, that's, you know, it's, it's very hard to look at a company for two weeks or, th or three months even and really understand how good is that team at executing when, when the times get tough or what kind of decisions have they made. But if you watch them over time, and then that then hopefully helps you then when it's time to do the investment, like, okay, I know this company, yeah, maybe I don't have the deepest due diligence, but I've been watching this company for a while, I'm ready to do a check really fast or, or a term sheet very quickly. Um, that's been the way we've been trying to approach it because it's, it is, it's incredibly quick right now and there's just a lot of people just who, you know, five million uh, out of a, you know, very large fund is nothing and so they just, they just, they just, they're placing bets left and right and we're a bit more thoughtful about each of those checks and so we have to be, have our own approach to make sure that we compete well in those uh, the situations. Yeah, we, we are, <clears throat> that's exactly the point that we made around kind of speed, but we are lucky because we, we essentially invest quite late. So some of the analysis is going to be a bit easier because you can see the company is actually there. It has revenue. You can see the product market fit. You can speak to customers. So it allows us to go faster. But the biggest thing for me is kind of uh, away from kind of, as you said, founders are spoiled for, for choice right now. So we can, we, you need to do a bit of a sales job. But also um, what we've, we've done, a, I think, a good job over the course of the last few years is also working very closely with some of these earlier stage investors, right? Because I think ultimately that is in my mind the best way to source opportunities for us at the stage where we play. So that ability to create relationships with the earlier stage investors, I think is super important for us because that we, we don't compete with them. We play at a different level and that's how you see the best companies and you're able to essentially share some of the learnings they have which helps accelerate your view on a company as well. Yeah, we were talking about the backstage about the, the cooperation among the investors in Europe, I think, is, is, is quite good. It's like in Silicon Valley, you see a lot of what we call sharp elbows where people just push each other out of the way of deals. And I think there's a lot more cooperation in Europe. And I think partly it's because a lot of the investors are very local. And so you want to work on the local level. But I think also it's just, it's just a different um, mindset in a way, uh, what happens in Europe. We're just nicer in Europe. <laughs> That's probably true. Uh, that's probably true, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, maybe if we still zoom about, uh, zoom out a bit. Um, so how do you see the disparity between available funding uh, and then the kind of uh, 
amount of good investment opportunities affecting VCs and asset class. So there are a growing number of LPs uh, joining the space and many new, um, many of them are trusting like first time fund managers. Uh, so some of them might be left out uh, unsatisfied. So what will this mean to, for VC in the future? How about you, Janni? Okay, okay, you go first. Yeah. <laughs> sure. so, so look, I think um, growth where we play, and I won't speak for VC, but like growth where we play is now an established asset class. Like people view it and LPs allocate it as an asset class now. And it, I think it, it'll have, it's probably one of the most popular ones and has been recently. Um, and you've seen an enormous amount of money come into the space. I think um, when, uh, when SoftBank raised its first fund, which for the time was very, very large, it was 100 billion at the time, the next biggest fund was a couple of billion. Now you have a proliferation of 15 and 20 billion dollar funds. So that's changed the growth asset class completely. And I think one, it'll change uh, LP appetite, but importantly, it'll also affect valuations, right? Ultimately, rounds are a matter of demand and supply. And if you have this much money that's been raised and it's dry and sitting by the, by, by the side looking to invest, you will see a natural kind of appreciation in prices because everyone's trying to get in this, in this space. So I think the increase in an LP interest in growth is kind of creating a new asset class in my mind, and that increased kind of amount that's been raised will pretty much drive valuations for the short term, which I think uh, is what we're seeing and what you will continue to see for a while. Yeah, I would agree that it's, it's interesting that um, VC has become, pardon the word, but institutionalized. Uh, I, I remember because, you know, I raised my first round for my first company in 1998, um, I was lucky to have Sequoia Capital as my investor, but they, you know, then it still felt like a clubby thing. It almost felt like there were a lot of VCs out there. It was a hobby, you know, and it was a very risky asset class. And so you had a very certain type of person that would invest in VC firms. And over the last five years and, you know, plus it's really become institutionalized where it is a viable asset class, especially growth. It's, 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 got, a, it's got a very clear risk profile. And so you're seeing co people coming in who would never have invested before, like especially in Europe, we're seeing uh, pension funds and insurance companies. They never would have invested in it. So the amount of capital coming in uh, from sources that never would have considered as a class of, 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 of investing uh, continues to increase. Um, I think it's because the returns are good and actually, again, it's institutionalized. So they can look at it and go, oh, these are professional managers of my money. They, they know what they're doing. You know, they're not going to be, a, it's not going to be a zero for me on this one. I, I, can, I, can, I can project out. There's still a challenge, I think, in VC that it's, a, it's an illiquid asset. And that's what you've seen some, you know, whether it be Sequoia or a few others have been trying to like solve this liquidity question because when you invest in a VC fund, you don't, you don't get any returns, uh, actually money back to you until five, seven, ten years down the road. I think that is a bit of a challenge still for some, for some investors, but there's just enough money coming in that um, I'm, I'm not worried about what you know, your question is like, are people going to be worried about like, oh, it's going to dry up capital if things don't work out. I think, it, I think it's hit, hit a totally different phase right now uh, as an investment. Yeah, thanks. Then maybe a bit of, of the topic of unicorns. I think we're going to cross uh, 300 European unicorns uh, this year. Uh, and as you alluded, Mika, earlier, they're coming from various uh, different cities, 26, uh, if, I, if I count it correctly. Um, and so we're not talking about just a few mega hubs when we're talking about Europe. Uh, Mika, what do you think this is? Is there something fundamentally different in Europe compared to, for example, US, where Valley uh, is kind of the epicenter of, of um, companies? Yeah, I think we did the same study, and, I, and I, I, it's amazing just because a year ago it was like 210 unicorns or something. Now yeah. it's 300, and and we looked up. I, I, it was 26 countries, but it was um, 65 uh, cities. Yeah, you're right. 65 yeah. cities around, and so um, I. You know, it, it's, it, there's so many different factors going on. I think that there is, there's just the fact that there is just enough capital and these companies are going global. Tech is taking over so many different industries. So whether it be agriculture or logistics, there's so many different industries that actually Europe has a lot of strength in. So I, I just, I think just the overall trend line is strong. I, I'm not sure what the number for the U.S. is, but they've also had massive explosion in unicorns too. So um, it's also probably driven by valuations that have also just jumped a lot up. Despite the fact that Europe, I think, is cheaper than, than a lot of the markets in the world, it's still the valuations have jumped up. And so unicorns have, have happened. Plus the rounds of financing have happened quicker and quicker. So you're seeing people, you know, within two years become unicorns. And so the, the, the speed has also changed. 
Yeah, I, th I think part of it, I fully agree with Miguel, but I think uh, what we're also seeing is, I think you're seeing Europe catching up a bit. Uh, I think it was where Europe was, was unnatural. Just given the size of the market, the availability of talent, the great academic institutions, the IP that was generated out of Europe, it was unnatural how few of these companies were being built here. So I think what's happened, I think, is Europe has caught up a bit to what's happened in, in the US and China in particular. So I think what you're seeing is much more of a natural balance. Uh, I do think there's a lot more to go, uh, and I do think there's a lot more companies to actually be built out of here. And what I love about European companies is if you look at them, at the, at the, and I think the reason why they trade at a bit of a discount initially to US companies is once you have a great company in one of the European countries, it's not a given that you'll be able to grow it to the other European countries as easy as if you have a great company in California and want to scale it across the US. So I think some of that initial barrier to expansion exists, and that's why they initially trade a bit of a discount. But once you achieve that, and once you're able to then go across the, the full kind of consumer spectrum in Europe, then your moat is quite high. Because once you're able to take, a, we invest in a company called Auto One, right? You can buy it seamlessly a car in Spain and sell it in France. That's a difficult logistic operational exercise. Once you achieve that, it's very hard for a new entrant to come in. So I think there are some natural kind of barriers within Europe that um, create great entrepreneurs and create great operational entrepreneurs in that, that I think you're going to see these people be able to, com to compete very very well globally, but there is a bit at the beginning as to how can you scale a company from one country to the other. Yeah, interesting. Um, maybe continuing on the topic, there's some kind of interesting ongoing development in many smaller European cities uh, currently, where the kind of first generation of success stories are starting to exit and distribute the kind of spillover effects to the local economies. Uh, how do you see, see the implications of that? Are we going to see kind of uh, second generation of uh, these smaller hubs around Europe, or, or what's going to happen next, Mika? I'm having a hard time hearing. So this, the, the second generation of, of founders, you're saying? Yeah. Well, those are, I think, as an investor, some of our favorite kind of founders is the second, third time founders. I think they're, they've gone through the, 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 uh, the exercise, and especially the, the second or third time founders who maybe had mild success in the first time around, but they're literally still hungry and they have a chip on their shoulder to really make sure that the, the next one's going to be bigger and bigger. Um, I, I, you know, that, that is, in the past, I felt like a European entrepreneur or someone who did well in their job, they would just go, uh, they would just go you know, down to the Saint-Tropez and just hang out. That was like a classic thing that I felt like when every time I met like someone fairly wealthy from Europe, like, yeah, I made a lot of money and now I'm retired. And, and in Silicon Valley, people didn't ever retire. They would always stay in the system. They stayed as, they became investors, mentors, started more companies. They, they, you know, they were on boards. And so the kind of talent pool and the knowledge pool in Silicon Valley always stayed in the system. And that's happening in Europe now where you're just, you, you're, you, know, every, you know, you might have done very well with your previous business, but now you're a VC or now you're an angel investor. So I really am, I'm, I'm been very, very happy to see that kind of trend that you don't see people leaving the kind of ecosystem. They stay in in some capacity and they, they share their knowledge or their capital or their connections or whatever it else be. So that I think has gotten uh, much, much stronger. Because I, I can't tell you, like in the 2000s, I met many people who did well and they were just like, I'm out of here. And I was just like, what? You, you, you know so much. You got to be in the game. Put, help us out here. So, yeah. yeah. Opinion. Yeah, I think, I think that's absolutely right. And you see countries that have had one very, very large exit, you can see how quickly the ecosystem gets built around it, whether it's because, you know, the founders are then some of the best angels in the country, whether they have like teams of people that have seen that large exit, you can hire talent now that's seen the ability to scale. And a bit that, you know, the entrepreneurs in that country are now dare to dream, right? If someone else made it, I can make it as well in this country. So I think there's a big emotional change when you have a very large exit in one of these countries. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing kind of all these things crop up and suddenly you see within that ecosystem a huge increase from there. So um, I think we'll see more of that. Um, I'm still waiting. I'm I'm Greek, so I'm still waiting for the big Greek exit and the, the <laughs> ecosystem to happen there. But um, I think I think I think it will happen across across Europe. Yeah. Yeah. No, in, in US, you had the PayPal ma mafia. Here, you have the Skype mafia, and I heard about the, the TransferWise mafia now, and you know all these little groups of you know people that have been done well one place, and they're taking that skill and going on to the next spot. So that's that's very fun to watch. Yeah. How about the kind of. Uh, future then, uh, can the number of European unicorns keep on growing? Like, where are the bottlenecks, if anywhere? Janne, maybe you can start. Yeah, I absolutely think it can keep growing. I think, uh, I think 
there are whole sectors of industry that still have a lot of disruption to come. Like there's so many things that frustrate us on a day-to-day -day basis as 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 uh, as consumers. There's so much to be done, and um, what's happening across kind of consumer expectations, technology, in life sciences, in fintech. There's so much to come, and I think uh, Europe is is ideally is ideally placed to create some of that um, some of that uh, innovation. We have great IP. We have great talent. And we have great capital now, so to make us point, we have all the various kind of uh, factors that contribute to uh, to growth and great companies to come out of here. So I'm incredibly bullish of Europe as an ecosystem, uh, and I think there's tons to come from here. I was listening to um, Sujay Tile earlier talk about uh, Latin America, and so what I've also found interesting is that I'm obviously I'm extremely bullish on Europe, but I've seen actually there have been ecosystems now sprouting up um, all over the world. And that, I think that just shows to the power of tech and innovation. It's just happening you know, in every country. I mean, I think Europe is, is you know, leading the pack in many ways because it was lagging in some ways. And so it's really, it's really making leaps and bounds. And I think what you've seen also is that um, universities and governments have now uh, figured out, oh, wait a minute, entrepreneurship is the future for us. We need to really benefit from that. So instead of spitting out uh, engineers and, uh, and designers and business people out of universities that go to work for big companies, now they're all going to entrepreneurship. And so the whole system is now starting to support it um, in Europe. And so I think, you know, like I said, all over the world we've seen these things, but I think Europe has this like a system-wide uh, effort to really uh, help entrepreneurs, which, which I think you know bodes well for the future. Because I think it's, it, I, I keep saying it, it, it just got started in the last three to five years, um, especially in terms of like universities and everything, all this stuff. Because we need more talent, we need people being trained, we need people excited about entrepreneurship. We need more slushes, basically. So it's 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 you know it's it's great. I think there's there's just so many different factors that tell me that, including what you said, there's just so many different um, sectors that are just coming up strong. Yeah. There's a lot of talk around uh, change in European founder mentality. Uh, I, I do agree, or I do think that we all agree that the founder mentality has been changing. But like, what does it mean in practice? How has it changed? Maybe Jan, you can start. Yeah, I think um, I think it's a level of ambition. Yeah. I think to to your point earlier, like previously, if you could have an exit um, early on and then retire to south of France, that was okay. Uh, and I think the level of ambition has really changed. The second thing is, in my mind, is the fear of failure. Right? A lot of, um, in Europe, in societies that I grew up, you know, if you had a company that failed, that was terrible. Your parents were ashamed to discuss it with their friends, right? Uh, but in other, particularly in the US, having kind of a serial entrepreneur that's failed and tried was a badge of honor. I think that's starting to change in Europe. The fear of failure is starting to go away. Combine that with the increased ambition and visible examples you can point to of other people that have done it, I think have created what we're seeing now, which is entrepreneurs being a lot more both uh, brave and ambitious and seeing some of the comps that we're seeing right now. I don't have much to add to that because I'm glad you said the last point there because I think also there's just so many examples in their local market. There's somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody, maybe maybe it's three perfect people removed, but like, wow, look at that person. They built a company with a thousand people. And so you look at it and go, that's how I got started. I was, you know, a couple of my friends started companies and I saw how they started companies. I'm like, oh, I could do that. I mean, it was really like, for many years, I thought it was a really distant, very difficult thing to start a business. But once I saw a couple of friends of mine do it, so that was a very local thing. I think it's a similar thing happening in different cities and countries. People see, they're in the news, they see, you know, the office, they're like, oh, wait, I could probably do that. So I think, you know, the first two factors, for sure what you said, and that third one, that there is concrete examples of how to do it, or, or at least inspiration why you should do it. Definitely. Can agree with that. Okay, maybe as a ending question, uh, we've been talking about the so-called European flywheel. Uh, what excites you the most personally in it? What do you, ex kinda, what are you waiting for in the European future? Well, I think you know the flywheel for me, like I said, is is an idea, the talent, and the capital, and, and those are all coming together in in a, in a, in a great way. Um, what what I've really liked about seeing in Europe is the, you know. As, as, you know, as long as it still remains the EU, and, and I still count uh, the UK as part of, a part of Europe, uh, the, the, the flow of, of, of these things is, is, is pretty amazing. So we have quite a few companies that have engineering headquarters in different places from their uh, HQ. And so they have this flywheel spinning, but not basically rooted to one 
geography uh, excites me a lot. I think it's really cool. That, and I think COVID has actually accelerated a lot of that because now you could, you could work from home. And so the idea that you don't have to be rooted somewhere um, to you know, still take advantage of this flywheel spinning, I think it's exciting. Yeah, it's kind of what we discussed before. For me, like it's being European, it's a huge pride thing. Like, well, there's, there's, yeah. there's no reason why Europe should not compete equally and win in the international stage. And I see kind of this happening now. So for me, it's uh, one, it fills me with, uh, with hope about the future. It fills me with hope about the great problems that come out of here. You know, I have three young kids and I don't want them to feel that they have to go to the US to become the next big entrepreneur. I love the fact that being in Europe now, you can do, uh, compete equally and have just as much of a future as you would have if you moved to the US. So for me, that's, as a European, it's a big thing. That's an excellent note to end with. Yes, thanks, Janni. Thanks, Mika. Thank you very much. Thanks, Thank you. Much.